Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is episode three of the Distraction Pieces podcast. My name is Scroobius Pip. Thank you for downloading. Um, straight off the bat, a lot of people are very excited about this one. Uh, we've got Mr. Alan Moore. Um, I need to thank you for supporting the last two. I hope you've enjoyed them. We kicked off with uh, Russell Brand two weeks ago, and then we had Zane Lowe last week, which was a great chat. Um, but this week it's Alan Moore. But before I get into that, I need to touch upon our sponsors. We're sponsored this week... Um, I'm excited about this one. We're sponsored by Onnit. Um, now, if a lot of you may not know, particularly UK listeners, Onnit is um, a human optimization uh, website. Um, they sell a lot of fitness stuff, a lot of, of fitness supplements. I'm sure you may or may not be into that. I'm personally a, f- a fan of a few of the th- uh, things they sell. I like their sh- shroom tech and the and the um, the hemp protein powder um but they they also sell stuff called n- nootropics um it's it's interesting it's it's a it's a new it's kind of a new science and there's a lot of work on it the great thing about on it is on the website they have um a lot of the research and kind of the blind tests and things like that um but yeah a nootropics are basically uh vitamins for your brain essentially to kind of turn things on there's there's a particular one I've used before called Alpha Brain, um, and kind of, the, uh, I guess the way to describe it is it kind of just, it's meant to go around and just turn all the lights on, if you know what I mean. I used it when um, I had a song called uh, You Will See Me. Um, some of you will know it, and in the video, I had to learn this second verse backwards, so I had to learn all of these, this whole verse in kind of backwards talks sound all he all that kind of thing and i used alpha brain while i was doing that and yeah i mean it's <laughs> it's a tough one to say because i've not i've never had to try and uh, learn a song backwards when not using alpha brain so but uh, i mean if you've seen the videos i think it worked i think i nailed it so yeah i'm a fan um but the cool thing is if you're tuning in and listening if you already use them or if you're new you can get 10 percent off as a listener of the distraction pieces podcast so if you go to onit.com slash scroobius pip that's my own separate page if you go there then you can yeah et- Everything you buy will be ten percent off, so that's pretty cool. Um, other sponsor is Redshift Rebels again. Um, a Redshift Rebels are a clothing company, and the guy who set it up, Chris Glasson, got his business degree and saw how much companies spend on advertising. Essentially, throwing money at someone to tell other people that their product is good, and he saw that as quite ugly and crass. So he decided to spend their advertising budget on bands and on club nights and and artists and just you know exciting interesting stuff um instead of spending on advertising in fact this particular advert right here he hasn't paid me a thing for (laughs) but the reason it's here is because when i started off for example he made a little ep thing for me so when i was was hitting the road um also as said he's um i've played his his nights or or at the redshift rebels nights before so yeah check them out they are a clothing brand and they happen to make awesome stuff stuff i've always won their trucker caps um but they also have a good ethic behind them and you can get 25 percent off at redshift if you enter the um code free cheese uh which again if you're not that familiar with me you it's a a reference to one of my lyrics but if you head to redshift rebels um they will give you a 25 percent discount with that code the final sponsor is just again it's a a non-sponsor it's my label it's speech development records check us out we are about to go on the road we are i'm i'm going to be touring with b dolan headlining who's amazing a rap act and war and peace who are just a combination of hardcore and hip-hop and dance and everything i'm going to be doing spoken word at these shows and hosting and djing and just getting involved come and see us on the road we're going to have to remember this off the top of my head now we're going to bristol um reading birmingham london brighton leeds liverpool um where next glasgow edinburgh some of these are sold out so apologies if you've missed them but grab tickets soon um then we're going across on a ferry to cork dublin limerick and uh not sligo sligo was cancelled because of poor uh promotion um then we ended up in galway that's right but i'm going to stop talking now because you're here to listen to the legend that is alan moore um i'm so pleased that when i put this an announcement up people were excited about it 
it was a great chat. I think you're going to uh, really enjoy it. I just went to Alan's house. Um, I had to arrange it all on his landline because um, he doesn't have a mobile phone or email or anything I like that. So um, his daughter, Amber, c- it comes to some of my shows and I've, I've met Alan a few times at shows and he's, an, you know, we got on. So I asked her to ask him if it was all right for me to call him <laughs> on his landline and arrange this. And it was amazing because I had those kind of nerves of a lot of you won't have grown up in the generation where if you wanted to ask a girl out, you, you had to ring a landline and, and risk talking to parents and stuff like that, r- rather than just tweet um, a crude picture or something like that. Um, so yeah, it was exciting, but Alan was lovely. He invited me there. He welcomed me and we ended up talking for about half an hour after the podcast as well. So I definitely think we're going to have to do another one at some point, but I'll stop rambling on and let you listen now to the third Distraction Pieces podcast with Alan Moore. This piece of fiction is the intro to distraction. Start that recording. Splendid. And 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 we're away. How how are you? Oh, I'm very well, Pip. How are yourself? I'm good. I'm good. Th- thank you for welcoming me in t- in- into your home. It's very. Uh, it was a nice drive up, and uh, yeah. It's delightful um, to be here. Now you're here in my den of mysteries. Exactly, and it's it's it's, it's somehow it's ex- exactly as I imagined. It's it's it, it's the perfect location for you. But the beauty here is we're audio, so people can't get to experience that because they've not been brought into the inner circle. But but we could describe it. We could describe the swimming pool. Yeah, the swimming pool is is. I've never seen black water, but um, it's, no, it's, it's it's interesting. <laughs> it's it's an unusual addition. Yeah, it never goes out of fashion. Uh, yeah, exactly. It certainly adds something and um, um, uh, a mystery of depth there, yeah. which I think both physically and metaphorically is is exciting um but yeah it's delightful um where to start before we we started rolling we were both discussing how we've both lived in the towns that we were born in our whole lives so what's kind of kept you in in sunny northampton and well i think that the answer to what's kept me in northampton is probably just the abnormal gravity yeah. Of the place I, I have des- in. I've described it is as a kind of a, an urban black hole <laughs> that you can't. The light of media tends to avoid it. Yeah, um, it's only visible by the kind of devastation out at its perimeter, and people who try to leave, they can never get up the escape velocity. They just get sucked back in sooner or later. You see. You- you need to be careful describing it like that because you'll get a lot of of, of 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 celebrities that wish to escape the the media and 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 highlight all all suddenly f- flock into to the surrounding areas surely so well I suppose it could be but I I'm not sure that celebrities really really want to escape they want to be s- s- seen to be attempting to escape yeah the, there, was, the there was a great <laughs> one of the uh, strange magical books that I started to accumulate back when I took on that profession. There was a thing called the Starlet Mire that was full of cynical observations about the human condition by a couple of Edwardian, um, probably aesthetes would be the politest way to put it. And uh, one of them said, there was once a ladder that reached all the way to heaven, yet no man climbed out of sight of the crowd. That's amazing. Yeah, uh, that's there, there is some truth in that. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, that's... I don't think we're ever going to be attracting that many celebrities to Northampton. Uh, I mean, like, I think uh, Alan Carr said that the best thing about Northampton was the the road out of it. And yeah, well, mind you, I can understand that experience. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's I mean, if of, Alan Carr says so, well, who are we he, to question? He used to, 
his dad, uh, I think, was the manager of the the local football team. Oh, really? So he'd get, which is the county ground just down at the bottom of the road. There. Yeah. Um, he'd get dragged down there on Saturdays. Amazing. And apparently he always took an Agatha Christie book along to read because he wasn't really into sport. No, that's and uh, it must have been hellish. So I can quite commiserate with him. However, yeah, you can understand. that's not the Northampton that I know. What, it's, what, what was it or, or was it something about Northampton that started you off uh, writing, I guess? Because, I mean, you started... Um, you, or how how did you start? I know you had some writing in 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 the enemy. I think or, uh, at one point, and early cartoons, days, kind of cartoons, some cartoons. Yeah, enemy. I mean, like um, I started writing back, and the same as I started drawing mm. and acting up in general. Yeah, back when I was probably about five or six. Yeah, um, good start it point. was just uh, I'd got a, a younger brother who was much, much better looking than I was. <laughs> and so a, the... A my older brother has suffered the same the same trials, so, you know... He's, yeah, he's, it's, <laughs> it's something... Yeah, this is, this is the problem with older brothers. So I had to come up with this, in retrospect, over-elaborate um, strategy for getting attention. Yeah. And um, I suppose that's what it was. But I tended to find that I enjoyed it. Yeah. The, the world of my imagination, um, it, was, it was much more attractive than the actual world that I was living in. Mind you, I liked that world quite a lot. Yeah. But it was nice to bail out of it occasionally into the kind of fantastic world of American comic books, um... And the British comics as well yeah. were, in some of them, were every bit as thrilling and oh, wonderful. Oh, what was inspiring and ex ex exciting you at those early de days? Can you remember the well, specific comics that you were into? Uh, well, back in the, the very early days, the first thing that you'd get would be British comics, mm -hmm. um, which I perhaps didn't appreciate them as much at the time as I do now. Often the way, often the way I've, I have that with, um, I mean, obviously it's, it's, it's very different, but it's taken me years in hip hop to get into and appreciate any of, of the UK stuff. And I realise now that there was some good stuff, but the appeal and excitement of something that bit away from where you are yeah. was all the more, you well, know. Well, this was it. I mean, what, looking back at those early British comics like the Beano and the Dandy and mm -hmm. things like that, I see people like Ken Reed, yeah. who was a genuine British oddball genius. Yeah. He uh, lived in Manchester. He created a brilliant fantasy strip called Fudge and Speck, which I believe appeared in the uh, the uh, local paper yeah. up there. But for the Beano, he created Jonah. And then when he went on to work for Oddams, he created this incredible stuff, which was often too ghastly. Yeah. To get into print, uh, there was a thing called The Nerves, which was about, um, there was a fat boy, but the main thing was what was going on inside him. Right. It turned out that his body was a kind of obscene factory that was staffed by microbes wearing hobnail boots, cloth caps, yeah. uh, smoking pipes. Yeah. Most of the episodes involved him regurgitating something, which was and still is hilarious, let's yeah. face it. Always. Always. A classic. And he did a, a thing called Dare a Day Davy where people would send in dares for the title character. Right. And I remember my late great friend Steve Moore mm -hmm. had got a piece of Ken Reed artwork that had been turned down for the pages of pal because the dare was um i dare you to dig up the skull of frankenstein and kiss it <laughs> um so you've got the character going off to transylvania where he finds a graveyard where happily there is a marker with frankenstein on it yeah he digs <laughs> up this skull which has got cartoon worms coming out of the sockets all done in an adorable Ken Reed style, but it's still a festering skull with maggots yeah. in it. And then you've got this this young boy 
puckering up his lips. <laughs> I mean, this is so wrong yes, on so many levels. Completely. It could only have happened in the late 60s or early 70s when it was a different world. And I, th- I think even more so back then, I think comic books and... And, 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 and that particular medium was the only place that you could really have no limitations in that way. You could do anything as much as, like, the only limitation was your imagination. You know, it really could take you absolutely anywhere. Well, this was it. And also, um, there's a class element in this. Yeah. In that the comic strips, both sides of the Atlantic, were originally designed for the working classes who were considered to be illiterate yeah. and unable to read without the aid of pictures. Sure. That was the audience, and so that was what nearly all of the comic strips focused upon. Yeah. It was all class-based humour. Over here, the first comic strip was Ali Sloper's Half Holiday, right. which was about a Victorian drunk and his low-life family and friends. Yeah. Uh, over in America, it was The Yellow Kid by um, Richard Alcult right. uh, that was in one of the Hearst newspapers and was considered to be, because it had got, uh, it was printed in colour wow, with yeah, the yeah. kid wearing a bright yellow nightshirt, yellow being a, sub, uh, a colour that everybody associates with well-being and happiness, So it was seen as a cheap trick by Hearst to get readers to buy his paper, even though the content was heading for the gutter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was seen as uplifting and yeah. Wow. And that was why that's where we get the phrase "yellow journalism." Oh, really? But it was all about a kid who lived in the slums. Um, The Dagwooden Blondie originally, uh, Blondie was a a lower class flapper. And Dagwood was uh, a member of the aristocracy whose parents frowned upon the marriage. Yeah. So it all started out like that. Yeah. Um, then uh, pretty quickly in America, when America tended to merge towards the middle class, mm-hmm. um, it was then you see all of the originally anarchic and lower class characters yeah. become suburbanised. Yeah, um, I mean, Mickey Mouse starts out as a spiky anarchist who <laughs> does insane, horrible, cruel things to animals. Yeah. But, you know, give it 10 years, and he's living in the suburbs, he's wearing a short sleeve shirt, he's got a couple of nephews, mm. um, Dagwood and Blondie are now in a middle-class sort of suburban American neighbourhood. It's crazy, the, the, the underlying but completely n- n- natural... A mirroring of, of of society through stuff that you would that that many would see, particularly at that point, as quite throwaway as the comic strips in these things. The fact that they can now be used to document the changes in that, society and everything else that is, is perhaps at the end of the day the best use for pop culture. Yeah, uh, I mean, yes, there is the thrill of it at the time. Yeah. There is what we all enjoy about it when we first hear that single or we first read that comic or read that book. There is that thrill. But um, years later, decades later, the real value of the thing is very often in how it reflected its times and what it said about its times. Yeah. I mean, like... um, with with the uh, the comics that we were talking about, it's worth noticing that um, superhero comics, when they first um, came into being, that was two working class boys from Cleveland, mm-hmm. um, and Superman was a vision of working class empowerment. Wow! Uh, I mean, he was the first. I mean, he'd got he was brought up in a rural environment. Yeah. Um, he was the first and last superhero to come from such an environment, pretty much. All of the yeah. ones that came after him were wealthy playboys, were doctors, yeah. were uh, arms manufacturers. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. These were all very, very War solidly heroes. ensconced in the middle yeah. class. And uh, that sort of... Um, that's the the big difference, the shift mm. between the origins of the character and the kind of industry that 
that came out of it. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's, it's right what you say. I mean, like, our, our trash culture, if you like, is often our best uh, indicator. I think of, it's because it, 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 it can often be the least, or, or can often come across as, as the least thought about and therefore the most s- subconscious of the lot. It's not overly analysed and broken down and, and we're doing this particular article and we need to be careful of what what truths we're actually t- telling. The kind of trash culture is more, here's just some stuff and you don't realise how much it's telling of the time well, and of what, the people. What I'd say is that, I mean, if you've ever worked in in that kind of trash culture, like working for comics yeah. with a weekly deadline, uh, even a monthly deadline, um that those constant deadlines, you don't really get the time. Yeah, yeah, of course. To edit your subconscious uh, impulses yeah. in the way that you would do in a more refined medium yeah, or yeah. art form. And so you do get things kind of leaking Slip through. through that, yeah, wouldn't have... I mean, you look at you look at the Godzilla films. Yeah. Um... Which, I mean, Tojo Pictures, when they started out, these were trashy, quickly made films. Of course. In the first Godzilla films, it's very difficult to escape the idea that this is in some way Japan's response to having atom bombs dropped upon Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That this is a big atomic monster that flattens cities. Yeah. Um, However... You you move on a bit, um, and Japan's relationship with nuclear power is becoming a bit more nuanced. Yeah. And as, yeah, you know, Japan was relying upon nuclear power. So nuclear power was suddenly our friend. And consequently, in the later Godzilla pictures, Godzilla is our the friend. Hero, yeah. yeah, he's living out on Monster Island with Mothra and all of the yeah. other nice monsters. And they only intervene when uh, some alien monster yeah. turns up and yeah. threatens to bring down the property values or yeah. whatever. Yeah. So these are pro-social monsters by the end of it, yeah. as is nuclear power. And it's a the pro-social monster. Of that. Yeah. yeah, that's absolutely. F- yeah, it's it's crazy how that's reflected so clearly and obviously. Um, so how was it? Um, I mean, we were talking before we started uh, recording about. Um, Again, the the uh, uh, one of the I'll, I'll say a benefits of gr- of growing up in a small town is not having a wealth of other people to work with at your ex- disposal. It, so you kind of you started off as as the artist, as the writer, as everything. How was it to go from that and then into the industry? Which, as you said, you suddenly got deadlines and a, uh, you have to choose a which part to hand over. I guess what are you going to be in that? Well, I mean, this uh, was a learning process for me. I mean, like, like I was telling you, I, I originally came out of the the, the arts lab scene yeah. where the idea was there's no reason why everybody can't do a bit of anything. Yeah, of course. That uh, you could try all sorts of things and you would find that actually involving yourself in a lot of different disciplines, it tends to... There's a cross fertilization process. Yeah. I mean, like when I did stand up poetry. Right, yeah. Um, I'd been writing it and publishing it in my little poetry fanzine yeah. that I was producing when I was at school. Amazing. Um, but when I actually stood up and had to read it, I suddenly realized that because a thing looks good on the page, that doesn't mean that it's going to work as a piece of performance. Yeah, completely. And that's when I started to realise the importance of rhythm. Yeah. Um, And this eventually fed back into all my other writing because I realised that, well, if I'm writing a piece of prose, even though the reader can't actually hear me reading it, the reader has got their own voice in their head. Yeah, and that is following a rhythm too. In some way, yes, yeah. exactly. So all of these things, they they help each other. Yeah. Um, they they help you to uh, in all of the different fields that you're working. Now, when I first 
decided that I wanted to make a living out of doing something that I enjoyed. Yeah. And it was originally as broad a notion as that. I mean, it's, and, but it's, it's not to be underestimated how big a decision and notion that is, because oh, gr- growing up, you're, I mean, where I live, we're just near London, and at school, the kind of, the the goal of everyone was to get your grades and then go and work in London and earn, earn money. And there was no, it's, it, it was only years later I realised that I didn't know what a working in London was. So it wasn't specific enough to a job. It was like you go into the city and you earn money and you come back. There wasn't a notion of I need to do something I'm passionate about or I enjoy. So it's an easy one to throw in there. But yeah, that's a, it's a huge choice to say that's what that's how I want to make my living. Well, it's like I, looking back, um, you know, retrospectively, I can see that that was actually the first magical decision yeah. that I made in my life, which was that simply that nobody else was responsible for my life other than me. Yeah. That um, there was nobody trying to hold me back. There was nobody trying to help me forward. That it all came down to me and that once I'd taken responsibility for everything, I found that everything started to work just fine. Yeah. Um, So that was a, a huge and empowering decision i think people it's hard for people to realize how much both success and failure are easier to take when you're aware that you're in complete control the absolutely a, a failure that is your own you, i don't know it's uh, i can kind of accept that a of failure course. where i feel i can blame someone else or someone's uh, let me down or held me back that's i'll stay awake at night yeah, thinking my, about that my for own hours. failures i'm completely big enough to yeah. carry them yeah um that's not a problem it's uh, it's only when you get something that is is compromised um, that is is not your fault yeah. that where you've done all the work that uh, y- you could possibly be expected to do and it has still yeah. broken down yeah, yeah that's that's much more difficult to tell yeah. so when I started out um, that was my only agenda. I want to, I can do a number of things. Um, let's see which one of them I can make a living at. Um, I, I was doing a lot of spoken word at the time. Um, I'd done one piece that I was very proud of, uh, Old Gangsters Never Die, which right. was a 10 minute spoken word piece. Oh, wow. uh, and it sounds brilliant. Yeah. To this day, it sounds brilliant doesn't mean a great deal right yeah uh, some I, of the best pieces do. well it, that's it, it. Oh, it will mean a great deal to, to someone who's listening yeah and i you mean can just go yeah that's what it meant i thought <laughs> yeah this does it sounds great it's a great performance piece and i'll still do it if pushed yeah um i can do it at the drop of a hat so Amazing. sort of but it didn't actually i thought this would have been better if the meaning and the impact had been there as well yeah. as the language and the rhythm um so that was you one see, way see I'd... now you've got me wanting to to, to 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 get you to perform it and 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 hear this now do you really want me to i'd, I'd love you to i'd love to hear this have you got 10 minutes we've got 10 minutes we've got as, as many minutes as you need go ahead old gangsters never die Except the few that pass away in cinemas at midnight lay there sprawling in the footlights for the usherette or ice cream girl to find. And if I die, God knows I might. Don't let me die in black and white. Don't make me share a haunted scream with every other ghost boy who stood trembling in the foyer sipping wine, then coughed and shot his cuffs. And checked the time and stepped outside and got cut down by dead policemen faces strobing in the panic light, their long dark cars parked out the back, their halos black against the night. And John Dillinger's name in finest bullet silver etched upon their hearts a cold tattoo upon the skin right next to where the badge is pinned. I could die carefully at dusk. Because, buddy, I once owned a diamond collar stud, and as I live and breathe, I swear that that's no lie. 
And men with such good taste as me deserve to cash their chips more elegant than those without a shirt upon their back or showing upon their dancing shoes. Like, like playing poker, being dealt the ace of flames you stand and whispering once your mother's name pitch headlong dead across the roulette table. Bullet holes pinned like our mistress poppies in neat rows across your back. Or drowning. Do you know, so many hoods and hit men got sent down to tread the riverbed for all eternity. And now they look like statues in some cold, submerged art gallery. And I would gladly kiss the hand of any man who'd bind my wrists and send me down to be in such good company. Dutch Schultz, Capone, why, men like that had hell stars in their eyes. And when they walked in groups of more than three, they must have looked like grounded constellations torn down from a B-film sky. Old oh, gangsters, they never die. Say, 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 wouldn't it be nice to fall asleep forever in some old speakeasy in the 1920s where they never pulled aside the blind and looked outside to find that the 50 years had washed away all of the legends and the suit suits and the blood stains like a fistful of dead roses someone left there with the hat check girl and drove off into old Chicago with their windows wound and their radios turned down to keep their holstered shoulders cold and dry old oh, gangsters they never die Hey, John. John, I got the tickets for the show here in my very hand. Enjoy the show. And when you kiss that girl goodnight there in her red dress streaming, do it carefully. Good burgundy upon the tongue, for she will kill you, John, and one must always kiss one's killer. <laughs> Ain't that so? Hey, Ma. They shot your boys out there, and as I live and breathe, I swear I never seen a pair who fell so sweet to hear the final poetry of Cordite in the air or turn their faces up like so, receiving death as, as if it were a, a mother's kiss or something black and rare. Hey, fellas. Is it cold there in that movie house tonight? Come on, let's pass out that Jack Daniels and we'll talk about old murders, double crosses and dead blondes and we'll say, here's looking at you. Here's blood in your eye. Old ghosts sit in the back room. Old dreams wear dusty clothing. Old bodies don't tell stories. Old gangsters never die. I wish we had a live studio audience here to give an applause now. That was fantastic. Well, Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it's something that I've been... Uh, I wrote it in 1970... 1974? Wow. So, so that's, that's that 40 is... Years, that's, this is the 40-year anniversary. 40 year, and I think that I can legitimately claim... Yeah that that is the first piece of gangster rap. Damn right. You started it all there. Yeah. The, so. the thing that I enjoyed there, um, obviously I, I see and, and listen to a lot of spoken word and uh, the things that I often appreciate and something that you definitely had there was the appreciation and awareness that the 
what isn't said is as important. The gaps and the pauses are as important as what's actually being said. And there was a lot of points there where the beat was, there was a beat a left silent to allow stuff to be taken yes. in and so as you said before to allow that rhythm and movement into into how you write so that was that was the first time when i got it into a shape that i felt happy with yeah and it's, it's an amazing i think uh, even more so uh, when performing in front of an audience those silences are key i've i've got a piece i do that i do quite early on it's quite a harsh and um emotional piece and the gaps will tell me what kind of room i've got you know, if yeah. I can, if I can be doing it at a festival and I'm speaking s softly and I pause and there's a thousand or so people in silence, then you know you've got you them. Know you've and, got that, them. And, that, yeah. and that and that 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 will make their hair stand on end more than anything I could say. The fact that they're in that bigger group and there's silence is more moving and emotional than the words that have caused uh, that exactly. silence. Exactly. You know I mean? It's so often. Uh, I mean, as with that piece, yeah, the the words they there are a series of beautiful images mm. uh relating to old gangster films old gangster mythology yeah, yeah. they don't actually say very much but sometimes as you say the words can exist as just the carrier of a kind of mood yeah of course and they have that 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 purpose that function yeah you know? completely i definitely agree now we're kind of jumping around over your whole career here but just speaking of gangster movies and films in general i just want to talk about you've your you, you've you've recently stepped into the the world of cinema with um a, a, a lex records and the guys at wolf and that who i did my first album with so i was, I was incredibly excited when i heard you were working with them on well it's on a kind movie, of so uh, let's mean, talk this, about that this is um this all grew out of um uh I was doing a piece. Uh, I'd written a piece about Steve Moore. Yeah. This was about eight years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd done it for an Ian Sinclair anthology called City of Disappearances. Yeah. And I decided to... Um, the, the brief was something that has disappeared, will disappear, or is disappearing within London. Mm -hmm. And I'd thought that uh, my mate Steve Moore was probably... A decent candidate yeah. for that so i wrote a piece called unearthing which was a biography of steve yeah um and i'd it was published in ian's book i was very pleased with it and then i had mitch jenkins um a, a local kind of world famous photographer who's yeah. i've just he's just been a mate he's part of the northampton bohemian yeah sort of melange you know he just popped round and said that he was getting a bit fed up of doing these celebrity shoots uh, that brought in loads of money and yeah, of they were very enjoyable but they weren't really satisfying his drives to art mm -hmm. he said have you got anything that uh, a piece of text that i could do a few photos that sort of are inspired by it. Yeah. The only thing I'd got was uh, unearthing. So I said, look, if you want to find something in there, it's 50 pages long, but, you know, if you can find an image in there. Yeah, that's great. He came back and said that he wanted to do the whole thing as a really lavish, gigantic photo book. Yeah. Uh, that took a number of years. And while he was doing that, he was in touch with Lex. Yeah. Um, and Lex was sort of uh, interested in doing it as an album. So before it had emerged as a book, they'd got uh, oh Mike Patton yeah. and uh, Stuart Braithwaite wow. and um, Justin Broderick, yeah. uh, just all of these impeccable cutting-edge yeah, yeah. musicians. And... Um, uh, of course, uh, um, Andy Drucker, uh, um, no, a Adam Drucker and, and Andrew Broder. Yeah. Uh, Crook and Flail. Yeah. Who, yeah. um, they were providing the structure of the whole piece. Yeah. And then getting in these various musicians to slot into it. That's amazing. That came out as a gigantic, um, triple album set or yeah. something it was it was pretty pretty spectacular as soon as i heard about it it felt like a, a great combination because of the passion and effort 
that uh, that Lex always put into their artwork, their packages to put something beautiful and artistic together, rather than it being a record label putting that something out. That's, gonna, that's, yeah, yeah it seemed to be a, a, a perfect combination because they would draw, draw that in. So, so where did it, it well, go from well, there? Well, what happened there was um, then at some time during this process, I launched into my beautiful but doomed underground magazine dodge and logic right yeah um which is one of the things that i am most proud of yeah, yeah. it lost a horrifying amount of money right but i am so glad that i did that magazine i thought it was great again it's the it's it's the perfect risks that are worth taking yeah kind of thing. the things that give you the most satisfaction yeah. and while i was doing that mitch called round and um he was saying, oh, I've just seen Dodge and Logic. I think it looks great. Can I do something? And at that time, Melinda, my, my wife, Melinda Gabby, she'd got an article in the second issue which was talking about the burlesque scene. Yeah. Uh, as she remembered it from San Francisco, where it was, yes, the women were very spirited and strong, but they were in a horrifying environment. Yeah. And the whole purpose of it was kind of the degradation of women. Right, wow. And Melinda was contrasting that with the people that she'd met um, from the modern burlesque scene. Yeah. It's a completely different state of affairs. Yeah. Most of the audiences are women. Yeah. Um, and it's, this is, it's kind of female empowerment. Mm. rather than the reverse. So Melinda had written an article about that. Yeah. And we said, well, do you want to do a photo shoot to um, to maybe go with the article? So Mitch thought that was a great idea. We hired the Jimmy's End Working Men's Club. Mm. Um, we got a load of our favourite burlesque performers down there. Yeah. Um, there was a couple of other characters that Mitch had dragged along just to help. With, he'd got a friend of his dressed as a clown, um, we've got um, uh, the Jazz Butcher, right? Uh, who's another member of the Northampton yeah. Mafia. Uh, we've got him down there um, playing a kind of seedy, sort of womanising, down at heel, sort of um, a character who hangs around in in bars like that. Yeah. Which, you know, it was a tremendous reach, but Pat they pulled that there. off, you know. It's, uh, <laughs> and um, we, uh, um, we did the, the, the shoot down there. It went great. I think that Mitch got nominated for a documentary uh, photography award. Fantastic. Uh, me and Melinda were both also down there and were caught in a couple of the pictures. Melinda was kind of playing a role of a kind of a a butch kind of manageress yeah. for these women. I was just in shot. I hadn't intended to be. And when we were putting who had played what at the end, I wasn't sure what my role was. So yeah. I put <laughs> Eastern European organ donor, organ, <laughs> organ trader. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> then a bit later, Mitch came round and said that he was – getting a bit he used to do a lot more than just take photographs he used yeah. to do uh you know music videos yeah he did some of the ones for like love and rockets and oh, wow. uh, people like that yeah and um he wanted to do a little 10 minute film for his show reel and he'd thought that perhaps he'd use the same setting the st jimmy's yeah. end working men's club use the same people and uh just do a little 10 minute film. And yeah. I said, well, if it's a 10 minute film, do you, do you want me to do a screenplay for it? Yeah. And he said, well, that couldn't hurt. And uh, I thought, how long could that take? Yeah, exactly. and, uh, <laughs> and it didn't take very long. I'd written um, a screenplay for what I took to be a 10 minute film within a day, uh, or probably even later that afternoon. Yeah. It wasn't very long. No. Um, and then we tried to get that made. Um, and I'd involved all of the characters that had been at the shoot. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'd had to change some of them. And Mitch had suggested a couple of other people that he wanted to bring in. Mm -hmm. um, his friend, uh, Siobhan Newlett, right. the actress. And yeah. uh, uh, Robert Goodman, yeah. uh, who's a mate of Bob, 
um, rather as he insists upon being <laughs> called. But, uh, uh, but yeah, Bob's been a, a friend of me and Mitch for 30 years, yeah. you know. Um, so we got all of these. I'd, I'd written this screenplay. Uh, it was just for a, a 10 minute film where the end of it is the whole payoff. Right. Um, and then in trying to get it made, um, I think we first spoke to Warp and they, or Film 4. Yeah. And they were saying, well, what we like to do is to say, do a 10 minute film that will build to a feature film. Yeah. And then that will perhaps lead on to a TV series. Yeah. Oh, wow. So could you do that? And I said, well, no. I said, because it's a, it's a one off. It's like, a single to one thing. story with a punchline, sure. and once that punchline has been delivered, then yeah. there's no way you can go with it. Yeah, of course. And then I started to feel my vanity was a bit stung by my own feebleness. Yeah. I thought, well, if I'm as good as I say I am, I yeah. should be able to think my way around a problem like that. I see. I mean, I wrote this in an afternoon. Surely. Yeah. I- <laughs> there must be a way around this. Yeah. Um, and then I thought, all right. Um, what if the punchline of the original remains, but is misdirection? Right, yeah. What if the actual story is much bigger yeah. than what... And that, that took some thinking about how does that logically work. Yeah. But eventually I said, yeah, all right, I've got an idea for the feature film that follows this. And... Um, and for a possible television series following that, I can yeah. see how it would work. Yeah. Then that kind of fell through. I think all the money was pulled out of uh, British film and yeah. television around about that point. This yeah. was around about 2008 or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and they decided it's not worth investing in television. Absolutely. I mean, it's not like shortly after that it's television not like became investing bigger than in cinema. culture, you no. know. It's, uh, so... Um, we were looking around for alternative ways to um, get these things made. We, at one point, were working with Hewlett Packard, oh. who were talking about this will be the first film that will be premiered as an app. Oh, wow. Um, oh, I didn't know what an app was, <laughs> but sort of, oh, I nodded, I played along, yeah. you know. Um, and they were suggesting bringing out this software package and they were saying, could you do like small Easter eggs, like other little films oh, wow. that so kind of around. expanded the, the thing? And I thought, oh yeah, maybe I could. So mm. uh, I came up with three. Um, there was, um, this is after already having written Jimmy's End, yeah. uh, I came up with one called Upon Reflection which is all reflected in the security mirror above the bar. Right, oh, wow. Which means that uh, you have to do it in one take. Yeah. Um, which I love gives a it, one take. Which gives it a real so, urgency and immediacy. Yeah, it just instantly, as soon as those those first a few a few minutes are out of the way and, yeah, you yeah. take it all in, it's like it's your... And it's, it's the most engaging. uncomfortable of all of the, the four films. Yeah. And we're not giving the audience a chance to look away. Yeah. And it, yeah, it's, there's no it's, cutaways. It's of music making them or... kind of complicit in something that's really unpleasant. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, that works very well. Yeah. Of course. And there was another one that we did called a professional relationship, which is basically um, it's a ten minute conversation, uh, mm. which you don't get yeah. in films or no, um, in television. It's just. Uh, Mr. Metterton and Mr. Matchbroit, who are my character and Bob Goodman's character, Mm -hmm. respectively, having a really bitchy conversation in a dressing room. Yeah. Um, And that works on a different level. And then there was his heavy heart. Yeah. Which is terrifying and um, uh, which was the film that we most recently completed. Yeah. And then Hewlett Packard, um, (laughs) they were trying to get our Jimmy's M project. They were saying, right, you've got it all designed. You've done all this. Let's take it to our software people and get this loaded up onto our tablet. Yeah. And uh, then we were away. So um, they took it to their software people and their software people said, yeah, there, there is a problem with this. 
your tablet doesn't actually do what you think it does. Oh, wow. At which point, you lit Packard, it seemed to my unpracticed eye, they kind of big time panicked. Yeah. And they got out of um, hardware altogether. Oh, wow. They bought a software company for something like 17 billion, um, which they later found had overstated its value. It was a bit of a trail of tears. And yes, Damn, and yeah. it was the Jimmy's M project that actually, in a small way, all of that precipitated off. that. Yeah, I mean, you'd think when you're engaging in such a project, you'd check that it's viable for the, yeah. <laughs> the medium in which you're putting it across it. This is it. So they collapsed. We hadn't got anybody backing us anymore. Um, we were then looking at, I think, Sony or somebody. Mm -hmm. That fell through. But before it did, I remember talking to Mitch saying, yeah, so what do we do if this falls through? Um, I said, what do we do? And Mitch said, well, maybe we could get one of the other, the little small films that we've written. Yeah. Maybe we could get one of them made. And I said, yeah, that'd be good. And then I thought about it a bit and thought, no, that wouldn't work <laughs> because that all gives away too much all ties in about the central film. Yeah. So I thought, well, what if I were to write a little short piece that um, would be easy to make and which was somehow connected to but outside of, which didn't give anything away yeah. but was connected? Yeah. And so Mitch said, yeah, it would help if you could make it just a couple of actors and a couple of sets. Yeah. That would be really mm -hmm. handy. Yeah, of course. And I got back the next day and said, uh, yeah, one actress, one room, and an answer phone. Yeah. And uh, he said, brilliant. Uh, Lex stumped up, I think, 11 grand, Yeah, uh, which was all it took to, to make that. We made Act of Faith, which was, um, that was 15 minutes long, as it turned out. Um, looked beautiful. And yeah. that, was, that was us showing people what we could do. Yeah. Once people saw that, all of a sudden, it sort of snowballed. Yeah. And um, we found that uh, we'd got some funding to make Jimmy's End um, and a couple of the other short ones, uh, which only left his heavy heart. Yeah. Uh, we got uh, a Kickstarter um, funding for that. It's amazing to have all these projects that all are so um, intrinsically interlocked. So it's not a case of really wanting to get funding. Like, you need the whole pack or it doesn't work. It's, it's, it's weirder than you that. You put bizarre bit. handcuffs it, on yourself there, Well, surely. well it's kind of... Um, <laughs> now, what I'm doing, um, it's, it's, it is an evil plan. Yeah. Um, but I think it, it might just work. It's... Yeah. Uh, when I originally was confronted with the idea of, yes, could you turn this into a film that then turned into a television series? I immediately thought of, right, so what have you spent the past six or seven years um, doing that's largely decrying film, um, all films that are made, um, you've said how they are all ridiculous and sort of, um, so if you are to go and make a film, you're going to have to make sure that you do something pretty good. A hell of a film, yeah. That actually is coherent in terms of all of your principles. Yeah. Um, so I thought, all right, now, and let's also think realistically, what does a modern film entail? It's not just a film, is it? Not these days. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got to spin it onto multiple platforms. Yeah, of course. Which is something that I've always railed against, not because there's anything intrinsically wrong with the idea, but because of the way in which it is always realised, which is always a completely tacky, commercial, pointless... Yeah. That it doesn't add anything to the experience. It's always a tag on. It's often, often an addition built by people that are nothing to do with the original vision or artistic yeah. quest. It's like, right, we need this team over here to make something to attach to to our yeah. piece. Which... And, and I'd, I'd known it from the 
a perspective of having created comic books that were only ever intended to be comic books. Yeah. That were meant to show off what the comic book medium can do yeah. that other mediums can't. Yeah. That was the that was the intention. So having seen that, having seen having realized that everything these days, if it's going to be a film, it has to also be the graphic novel, the computer game. Yeah, sure. All of these different um which are they've not got any thought to them other than I bet we could make some money out yeah. of putting something out with Completely. this brand on it. And there's that lack of realisation. I mean as you, you you touched upon earlier how certain there's certain things that spoken word can deliver that written poetry can't but equally there's stuff that written poetry can deliver that spoken word can't i think that's exactly the same with with something like the watchman you created a graphic novel that you know you in film you can't then get across all the pages of 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 of, of written and, and and case file notes and everything like that you can't get that across because it's it was so encompassing of the medium within which you were working so yeah i guess the challenge is then to find a, a, a movie approach but again it has to be a written something well, original that's well, what, going into this what i thought was all right now if i'm going to actually confront this issue i'm not just going to confront it i am going to uh attack it aggressively brilliant um so i thought all right so if i can't do a film that isn't that if I know that it's going to be made into the graphic novel, um, into the computer game, into all this other stuff, how can I subvert that process? Yeah. How can I turn it into something which benefits me yeah. and benefits the art rather than benefits a protest which I detest? Yeah. Um, so I thought, all right, let's have all those things, but let's think them through. Um, so, yeah, we're not going to have a graphic novel adaptation of the film we thought what if there is a comic book element within the narrative mm -hmm. that is actually in some way helpful to the plot to the story right yeah in some way um what if there is a computer game not of the film but a computer game that is actually in the film yeah that people are playing yeah, that's great. Uh, um, what if, and then I started to think, what if, like, we'd already thought we we wanted to have a kind of a strict aesthetic on doing this film. Yeah. No CGI, because CGI is bollocks. Yeah. Uh, it's the death of the imagination. Sure. Um, if you can't mesmerise people and fill them with wonder with a few old school special effects you're not trying yeah um completely we also said no non-diegetic sound uh which is um i'll, I'll take that mystified look yep. from your eyes confused Go it's ahead, sort of that. i only use that word because nobody knows what it means and Perfect. so you can it's you know it intimidates so. people yeah. <laughs> so yeah diegetic sound is um sound if i've understood this properly is sound that the characters in the film can hear as well. Right. So that's music on a radio, on a jukebox. Yep. Um, non diegetic sound is the sound that's just um, the spooky sound when <laughs> someone's going the downstairs. A, a yeah. scene. I always love in, in a lot of, of, of Gaspar Noe's films, um, it, it blew me away in which film was it? In, in Enter the Void, where there was two characters are walking along the street having a conversation. And parts of the conversation weren't that clear because they'd turned their heads and it was recorded l live. So when he's turning his head, you're not hearing that dialogue quite as clearly because you wouldn't in real life if there's if sure. you're in the street. And that blew me away because I've never seen a film that did that. Just went, right, so if you were actually here watching these people, you wouldn't hear every word perfectly d delivered. So again, it's taking that whole idea of m being in that moment rather than it being an outside force or an outside yeah. pr production. Yeah, so, I mean, like, we, we just thought, all right, so we're going to have no non diegetic sound. Yeah. Uh, and then we thought, right, so that means that we're going to have to get in a 
I think I think the correct term is a shitload yeah. of yeah. Uh, of music, which we're going to have to get the rights to. Yeah. And then I thought, well, no, I don't fancy that. Um, be much better to just steal everything. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I like if that. if I kind of come up with a song that we like, mm -hmm. that we want to use, then I'll come up with completely different lyrics. Yeah. And then we'll give it to Adam and Andy. Yeah. They'll come up with completely different music, but has still is still doing the things that we yeah. wanted that song to do. Yeah. But is actually more themed towards our overall yeah. film and what it's about. That's great. Um, so I love the idea of all of that because um, the the fact I'm I'm jumping in in in, in the middle of it, but it's purely. F from excitement so forgive me um the idea that a computer game or a comic book in the film or even the music in the film that you will only see parts of but if you're then to go in and listen to that song outside of the, of the film you will learn more about the film if you go and play that game outside of the film it's you can still watch the film without physically playing it but physically playing it will give you more of an insight into well into that. And, and also once once we'd thought that up, and yeah, the, the album of music that is coming out with the films yeah. at the end of this month, I'm as proud of that music. As, I mean, we've got like Tunde Adabimpi singing yeah. um, Queen of Midnight, which is beautiful. Wow. Um, but this kind of gave me the idea of, um, oh, this is interesting, isn't it? We're, we're, we're making songs... This is like a jukebox from a parallel world. These are imaginary songs by imaginary artists that never existed. Yeah. Except in this little world of the imagination that we're detailing. Yeah. I wonder if you could expand that principle. Um, we suddenly thought about, um, you know, like in Coronation Street back in the day when they went into the corner shop all of the brand names are out of focus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you can't advertise. Can't have the advertising real. and the sponsorship. Yeah. So we thought, all right, let's do the same thing with that then. Um, any product, any magazine, oh, wow. any newspaper, anything that is glimpsed, um, let's make something up. That yeah. uh, So we've got a whole range of things. We made up uh, an energy drink called Fuel Rods. Excellent. Uh, slightly longer, slimmer tin, and it's bright glow in the dark green. Yeah, perfect. Um, we <laughs> came up with, uh, oh, there's a range of drinks. Um, I think in Act of Faith, you actually glimpse one of them, which is uh, uh, Tunguska uh, Vodka. Right. Which was like the, the meteor strike that happened in 1908 that oh, right. flattened the whole of... They thought it was an atom bomb or something, right. even in 1908. Yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, probably a meteor. Yeah, in but, all uh, Yeah, we thought that's a good name for a brand of vodka. Yeah. Because it happened in Russia. Yeah, it's know. great. So um, we got um, Lads Mags. We've got supermarket um, celebrity magazines. Yeah. Clammy. <laughs> um, and we've actually, we've, we've worked out a load of imaginary celebrities and Brilliant. dopey, crappy TV shows that they appear in. Yeah. Um, uh, the clammy web website is written. Um, it's amazing. And so we've essentially built a whole world. Yeah. And the, tele the shows on the television, um, they're soap operas, um, like Wittgenstein Terrace. Right. And sort of uh, other ones. We've got a whole TV scheduling so that when you see the TV, if it's just on in the background in a scene, yeah, it will be something that we have thought They've through and, and created. Through. The amazing. adverts for big CGI movies. Yeah, we've got um, a TV advert for a movie that's obviously a big stupid CGI movie. Yeah. that's called. Insomnivore. <laughs> he eats your sleeplessness. <laughs> and we've got a racist um, independent political party. Right. Called GBIP. Brilliant. <laughs> um, I think their slogan is, uh, yeah, gas the intolerant. Yeah. Um, with all of these details. And then we, we've had, like, 
a soft drink company say, well, if you want to put that in your film, we'll make it. That's amazing. Now, that, obviously, I don't care yeah. whether a soft drink comes into being. Yeah. But this establishes a principle. Yeah. Whereby you can set up an export business from the imaginary world that you've made up. Yeah. And import them into real life. Yeah. And at first, it might just be bits of culture. But sort of, um, I was thinking, you know, you could practically come up with anything, couldn't you? And import it into real life. Yeah. You could come up with, say, imaginary social institutions um, and then see if you could materialise them. Yeah. It's actually pretty much exactly um, what my theory of magic talks about doing. Yeah. But it's doing it in a coherent, rational, and actually feasible, a feasible modern and, and way. understandable modern way as yeah. well. A kind of it's all stuff that we've that, that we're familiar enough with in principle or as as setups in it being a film in this and that. But then yeah, yeah. So we we got. Room. I mean, like the idea of all right. If there's going to be an element of comic strip in this imaginary world. We thought what would be good is to have a scene where you've got a main character walking across a car park in the background. Mm -hmm. In the foreground, you've got a gang of kids who are sitting around reading a comic. Yeah. And it's a comic that they have unrolled from a kind of tube. Right. This is a device that I decided was called a spindle. Yeah. Where you pull down a flexible screen. Yeah. Which would give you a larger screen area. Um, and these kids are enjoying a different sort of comic yeah. on that device that is called electric comics. Um, and in the scene that I described, they're looking at something called Big Nemo, right? which is a, um, a, a twist upon Windsor McKay's original Little Nemo. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, and is dream themed, like most of the things in this world. Yeah. Um, then we found out that there was, um, a grant available from Nesta, the innovations charity. Right. Um, and we have said that, uh, we want to create a new kind of digital comic book. Um, and we also want to create the toolkit so that anyone can do that. Yeah. And then make that toolkit open source. Wow. And wow. so we are, and we've got, uh, uh, there's me, I mean, Leah, my, uh, my oldest daughter, mm -hmm. um, she's kind of handling the project yeah. because her and John Repian had worked previously upon the Thrill Electric for Channel oh, wow. 4 online. So yeah. they actually have got some experience in this. Yeah, and knowledge in that. Yeah, this completely untested yeah. medium. But uh, we got some really good writers in. Got Pete Hogan and Garth wow. Ennis, and sort of. Um, I'm, I'm a massive fan Lear of Garth Ennis. Lear I think oh, he's one of the Garth, best he's, series. He's, he's brilliant. I mean, like uh, I've just written a. I'm, I'm working with Garth. Saw him a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, he's, he's, I read that you're being drawn back in to do some stuff on Cross or to do. A, I'm doing a some stuff for Avatar the at the moment, and yeah. yeah, part of that is this thing on Cross because. Um, you know, when I re originally read that, yeah. uh, I was, I had, I had to put it down. It was too much. Yeah. It was too horrifying. Yeah. Um, when I spoke to Garth and I thought, ah, oh, that was a cowardly thing to do with an author like Garth. Yeah. He's, he's a good, you should have stuck it out. When I stuck it out, I thought this is actually a profoundly moral book. Yeah. I mean, I had ex ex exactly the same. I f the boys was the one that made me f or fall in love with Garth and then a, a preacher, of course. So when Cross came out, I thought, I'll give it a look. And I was a bit the same. I was like, for anyone who, who hasn't read it, it's kind of a zombie situation, but the kind of illness that they get also heightens their desire for sex and violence, essentially. So it's grim. It's, it's a whole world of everybody. You want to eat and kill, but you also want to Turned into and mad rapists, cannibals, yeah. sort of... 
it's the most horrible thing that you can possibly imagine, just about. Yeah. And, um, but and it's then a great it's, read. <laughs> how do you deal with that? <laughs> yeah. And what, which of your morals would you be able to hang on to? Yeah, it's that? looking at society and said, yeah, exactly that, how you deal with it and how you have to adjust and, and, and what has to become acceptable in that. In yeah. that situation, in society, are what you have to say, right? In in the current living world, obviously, it wouldn't ex- be acceptable for me to do X, Y, Z. But if this had, is what the world had turned into, and I hadn't got this disease, yeah. what? How would I re- act? This and how would? It. Yeah, it's this fascinating. Is it. I mean, it's sort of like yeah. I mean, with the um, with all the electric comics and stuff. I mean, and yeah, the the game escapism. Yeah, that was. Um, uh, we handed that over to Amber, who has produced yeah. a game document. So oh, the wow. game document exists for this thing. We've yeah, got it all fantastic. thought through. It would, to realise it in its, in the form that we've got it in, it would probably cost about as much as Grand Theft Auto yeah. or more. Yeah. So we're going to have to wait a while on that one. That's fascinating, though. But and it's, it's all it's bubbling just, up. It's, it's exciting, the, the concept now of, <laughs> say you had something in, the comic book in the film, could you export something from the comic book's fictional reality into the fictional reality of the film and then, as you said, export it into real world? Well, so I it's mean, just kind of there's these endless uh, loops and chains of it, what's it, in this fictional world that you can then can become something up, in the real world. It opens up a lot of strange possibilities. For one thing, I've always thought that advertising was evil. Right, yeah. Um, I know that that's probably an unfashionable position, but sort it's of fair. it kind of is. Yeah. Um, you're manipulating people's minds um, in order to get them to buy your product. Yeah, yeah, um, I don't think that's on. Um, however, I do quite like the idea of making up something that doesn't exist mm-hmm. and then, yeah, somebody else creates it, advertises it. It's kind of the reverse of advertising yeah. in a way. Because it's, yeah. Because it's, and, and like I say, it does establish this principle of things emerging from a world that is completely one of the imagination. Yeah. And then breaking into the real world, especially yeah. since the whole theme of the film is about a world of the imagination that is attempting to subvert. Yeah the material world in which we exist it's, it's, it's fascinating and it, it's, it's it's very loosely linked but it makes me think as i heard a while ago how the first ever advertising jingles weren't played or recorded by any companies the jingle would come um written out in musical notes on on say a packet of cigarettes and it'd have the notes and lyrics and people would sit around the piano and be s- sell into themselves that yep. that that reads the jingle and the, the crazy so particularly when they didn't that wasn't something that existed you didn't have have radio and, and whatnot then so the fact that these jingles you're you're making people sell to themselves and it's yeah i'm making this thing that that that, that, that doesn't exist appear yeah only to those who it's targeted at, so exactly. it's kind of yeah, it's a, bizarre. Well, the, I'm confusing okay. myself now. It's the, the so yeah, only no, things no, to think but, through and go around. It's, it's <laughs> actually at the risk of, of taking us even further off whatever the track was. Yeah. I, I'm reminded of, yeah, people did used to do that. It was a culture of sitting around the piano yeah, at one yeah. point. And I remember something that Malcolm McLaren told me yeah. when in my brief association with him back yeah. when we were doing fashion-based and he was talking about um, before there were um, pornographic home videos. Yeah. What people used to do, um, a businessman perhaps coming home from the city for a weekend, mm-hmm. um, he'd pop into a shop and what you'd get was a little playlet with sheet music. Right. Um, a pornographic playlet with sheet music. Oh, wow. And like this might just be for perhaps you and the wife. Yeah. Um, conceivably, perhaps for just you on your own. But I don't, <laughs> I don't really see how that would work with the, the piano. But no, anyway. But the... Um, or perhaps the neighbours might be invited around. And you've got the image of all of this pornographic activity going on while somebody it's is sitting there at the piano... 
playing you the... See, as, as bizarre as it is, I also think there's a certain beauty in that, the fact that you're, you're taking um, a literature home or a project home, essentially, for your... Eroticism, and for rather than the simplicity now of, of cl- clicking on an image on online or yeah, buying a are, magazine, the kind you of are the a beauty participant. There. You yeah. are a character. You are. It's it's very. It, it's got to be said. It must have been very immersive drama. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. imagine. But um, <laughs> I can't imagine I'll, if you'd have to. You'd probably. I assume you'd have to learn your part beforehand because surely if depending on where these stories take you, it'd be hard to pause and, and refer to, to, uh, to your notes. And the concept, of line. Re- <laughs> the, the concept of rehearsals uh, yeah. actually yeah. is a bit strange as yeah. well. It's a I bizarre mean, one. I suppose looping back to something we were talking about yes. a, a second ago, I mean, you were saying about these uh, the new comics that I'm, yeah. I'm yeah. working yeah. on. Yeah. Um, the, uh, yeah, stuff for Avatar, stuff, um, I'm, you know, working with Garth and... Uh, some of the other brilliant writers that they have yeah. there. And one of the reasons for this is, yeah, I am good at comics and mm-hmm. I enjoy it. They're, they're one of the mediums, the media that I uh, almost enjoy. Yeah, that's great. Um, the comics industry, I am pretty much alienated from. Mm-hmm. Um, however, that isn't any reason why I shouldn't continue to enjoy this medium. Completely. Um, that's good to hear. Because it was, it was one of the things I wondered, because obviously you've talked in the past with the comic book industry and with the film tie-ins with all of it, how you're not a fan of it. And I, I wondered if that kills your enjoyment of it at all or means or kind of steps you out of it. Or it do has, you still get to... It's killed a lot of my enjoyment of my earlier work. Right. Sure. Mainly because there's such an accumulated amount of misery and broken Just friendships. Horrible histories and, over it, yeah. uh, yeah, abuse yeah. that are connected with a lot of those earlier books yeah. that I don't really want to see them anymore. Yeah, sure. You know? I understand that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I still have a great deal of passion for all of the media in yeah. which I work. Yeah. You know, I've just finished the first draft of Jerusalem, yeah. which isn't a million words long. Yeah, um, good work. It's, it's a measly... 615,000 words. That's fine. So it, it's practically a pamphlet. It's a few. Yeah, I know. It's sort uh, of... Uh, uh, I'm, I'm a bit embarrassed by it now. And that's all kind of lined up and scheduled for... Well, a, we're working upon what um, Joe Brown, who you yep. met coming, coming out the out. door, he'd just come round to pick up the um, four... Uh, uh, the first five chapters... Yeah, which he him, didn't have a wheelbarrow, so yeah, he was obviously well. He got it on his memory <laughs> stick, and sort of, yeah. and he's going, he's, he's going to, him and somebody called Donna Scott, mm-hmm. uh, who's a local writer, yeah. they're going to be working upon um, the first pass of editing this. Excellent. Um, so that's all coming along. Yeah. Um, yeah. Working on the film, I've got the <clears> screenplay <throat> written. Yeah. For the feature film that is supposed to follow the Jimmy's End films yeah, and all the rest of, course, of them. Yeah. Um, so that's all coming along nicely. Um, various other projects. Yeah, the Book of Magic is... Yep. Um, yeah, I'm going to have to finish it on my own now. That'll be a bit weird, but I can do it. Sure. Um, that's something that I'm hoping to start on in the next... Uh, can we touch... I mean, as we've... Obviously, we're over an hour now, so I should, we, uh, I, sh- I should start to wrap up, but can we kind of end by t- talking a little bit about about magic and about your your love and your because I mean there's 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 from s- seeing you um, uh, uh, Robin Ince's events and things like that there is a lot of discussion of of magic, but also from a kind of almost a, a belief of a point of view a religious a point of view almost or philosophical and kind of uh, more encompassing than oh. Yeah. M- Okay. Magic tricks or anything like that, you know. Sure. Well, I mean, I'm very, very serious about magic. Yeah. Uh, I think that it is, other than sports, mm-hmm. which I assume was the hunters showing off, right. <laughs> every other part of human culture evolves out of magic. Yeah. Uh, performance does. Mm-hmm. Um, originally, it's some guy probably dressed in a weird animal outfit, dancing in the flickering firelight and with some sort of rhythmic sound that he's making to... It's the shaman, originally. Uh, Written language. That 
must and uh, and all representational art. These are such major steps forward in consciousness that the first person to actually employ them, it would have been in a shamanic context. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, politics, although it would have been an alpha male, perhaps leading uh, or having that function in those early tribes, he would have had an advisor. Mm. Um, that would have probably been the medicine man. Yeah. Um, so this is where it all started out. Yeah. Um, basically, one of the things we're arguing in the Book of Magic is that the entirety of our culture is pretty much the dismembered body of magic right. that we have taken apart bit from bit. We've removed the function of magic. Yeah. Until today, there is pretty much empty theatrics. Yeah. That is all that it has left. Yeah. Now, that's not the way that I see magic. I see magic as the act of interacting with our own consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that uh, before we understood what our consciousness was, along with uh, Julian Jaynes, I believe that the voices in our heads, we wouldn't have known that that was us. Yeah. We wouldn't ha have a concept of mind. Yeah. We wouldn't have a concept of dreams. The most logical way to interpret all of these things was a, a magical or shamanic worldview. Yeah. And that was not necessarily wrong. It was simply talking about a different level of experience. This is the, the main thing about magic, mm -hmm. is that science is the most beautiful and elegant tool that we have ever created for examining the material world around us. Yeah. Science cannot examine our consciousness because our consciousness is made up of things which are not repeatable in laboratory conditions. Yeah, of course. Um, so science cannot and should not. Um, yes, it can map the areas of neural response in our brains when we're doing a certain thing. Um, but that, of course, tells us nothing no. about the processes of thought. Yeah, yeah. Um, they're two different worlds. Um, I believe that the, there is the material world and there is the world of our ideas. Mm -hmm. And I'd say that we tend to think of the material world, that's the real world. Yeah. No, they're both real. Yeah, completely. Our thoughts are real. They're yeah. just not material. Th our thoughts aren't a physical th th thing, but they're... They're everything. They're, they're our everything. Our interpretation of anything is our, physical. Yes, exactly. And our entire interpretation of the world, we do not experience reality directly. Mm -hmm. We only experience reality in our retinas, mm -hmm. in our, the tympana of our ears, yeah. uh, in the cilia of our nostrils. We, we experience our perception of reality. Yeah. That's all we ever can experience. It's, again, it's a, a mental interpretation of a light reflecting construct. off of things. That, so even, even the things that we can f physically see, that's our, that's yes. our interpretation that is the of only, light reflecting. That world of ideas yeah. is the only world that we will ever know yeah. um, directly. And so whereas science is perfect for dealing with all of the things of the material world, you need something else to talk about what is to us the only real world, mm -hmm. which is the immaterial world. And if you think about it, the material world is entirely founded upon that world of ideas. Yeah. We have a physical chair, but that came from the idea of a chair. Yeah. If we took away all the physical chairs in the world, it wouldn't really matter that much as long as we still had the idea of a chair. Yeah, yeah. Then we'd know how to make it. Yeah. So the entire material world is standing upon this world of ideas and concepts and, and art. At the end of the day, I think that, as we will be arguing in the Book of Magic, that you have consciousness... You have, I believe that consciousness actually emerges at the same time as art and language. Right. And I believe that this phenomenon 
is what you would call magic. That right. they are all synonymous with magic. Consciousness is magic. Mm -hmm. Art is magic. Yeah. It's um, and writing is magic, especially writing. Yeah. If you look at all of the magic gods, uh, they're all the gods of language. Uh, right. Hermes, uh, Mercury, um, Odin, mm -hmm. um, okay. all of them. Yeah. They're a foth of the Egyptian magic god. He's yeah. also the scribe god. That's because language and words, yes, our entire reality is inside our heads. We've just said that. Yeah. That reality is entirely made of words. Yeah. Um, we do not have consciousness until we have language. That doesn't sound right, I know, but that is what most language theorists accept. Yeah. That consciousness, language precedes consciousness. Yeah. You don't have a concept of a thing until you've got a word for it. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so this is, I suppose this would make... When I'm talking about magic, I'm talking about a more strenuous mm. um, approach to your own consciousness. Yeah. And when I say magic is art, I think that there is a tendency for people to think, oh, right, so when he's talking about magic, then he's, he's actually only talking about art. Right. No. No. When I am talking about art... I am talking about magic. Yeah. That is very different. Yeah, yeah. It's okay, sort of, yeah. I am talking about magic with all of the power and the astonishing range of effects that you've ever heard it had. And I'm talking about that being possible through art. Mm. All of the things that magic claims to do, yes, it can do that, but only inside your head, which is the only place it needs to happen. Yeah. Um, that is the answer to all of the, yeah, can I, can I make myself fly? No, of course I can't because there's a law of gravity mm -hmm. that rather stands against that. Can I project myself into an imaginary space where I am flying? Um, can I perhaps do that so forcefully that it will be a different state of consciousness where I will be receiving useful information of yeah. some sort. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah. Um, it's not necessarily easy doing magic, but it's mm -hmm. quite possible and it's quite rational. Yeah. Once you accept this split between the material world and the immaterial world, and once you remember that they're both real, yeah, that's, that's, that's fascinating. I've, for a good f a, f a few years now, I've been working on a story, as many people are working on a, a novel or something, but a story I've never quite finished. And it lends to this perfectly because it's all about a guy who becomes comfortable with the difference between our waking reality and our dream reality and comfortable sure. that they're the... It kind of goes goes around in circles but the reality is the only difference between the two is is waking up you know if in your dream you become scared you physically you know your body reacts yeah. if you become you know if you're having an enjoyable time you physically react so yeah. it's that weird thing of yes so it's a kind of i, I keep meaning t a, 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 to wrap up but what how does the dream world kind of come into your belief on on reality there because surely that's the complete that's completely in your head and therefore no limitations and yeah. no boundaries yeah now the thing is that uh, when i first um became interested in what i thought of as magic yeah i thought it would make sense to actually look at what some other people have done, um, and I apologise, we've just had our uh, dustbin men turn up outside, so uh, um, but that's they fine. won't be here for a moment. But, no. but like, um, I thought it would be good to look at some of the systems yeah. that other people have come up with um, for understanding and mapping that territory. Yeah. Um, I found the Kabbalah, and I'm not talking about the Beckhams or Madonna, I'm talking yeah, about yeah. an original knowledge system yeah. um, that probably dates from round about the first century yeah. AD. 
sometime around yeah, then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alexandria. And sort of, uh, uh, with that, you've got, yeah, you've got the area, the sphere of dreams and the imagination. Um, and you've got the material world. They're separate spheres. Mm -hmm. They're connected, but they're separate spheres. Yeah. Now, in terms of how dreams fit in with all this, I'd say that, are you familiar with the phenomenon of lucid dreams? Yes, yes. Uh, you, you've had one? Um, I've, I've, <laughs> I've got a friend, Chris, who was, for, for many years, had lucid dreams r r regularly. And it was, one of, it was weird because people always say the most boring thing is when you tell someone about your dreams. But it became an, an obs obsession of his because he had such control and such reality well, within there well if uh if you actually can um achieve lucidity in your mm. dreams i mean i think i've done it once or twice yeah uh and it was extraordinary yeah because what that is is you are entering this uh this world of the unconscious yeah but you are entering it consciously yeah in normal dreams, um, we are unconscious in the world of the unconscious. Yeah. We do not know that we are dreaming. Yeah. Um, in a lucid dream, you suddenly wake up within the dream mm. and are aware that it is a dream and thus become aware that you can control it, yeah. that it is all a product of you, yeah. and that it is malleable that can be shaped yeah. by so your will. I mean, the times I've I've ever come close to that, as soon as I've had any awareness that I'm in a dream, it's when I've then snapped out of it and woken up. So I guess it's being able to take in that being information. Able and, to, and also to <laughs> sustain that state, yeah. which is, is difficult and takes some practice. Yeah. Um, being at, Because there seems to be some sort of sensor mechanism almost in the brain that tries to trick you out of it. To pull you straight away, yeah. Um, but it's very rewarding if you can get through that. Now... Why I see that fitting in is that that is true. If you can wake up in your dream and realise this is a dream, then you can take control of the dream. Yeah. I think that that is true in terms of our normal waking life. Sure. That to a certain degree, all of us are living in a kind of sleep. Mm -hmm. We are bombarded by the culture around us. We are lulled into a kind of a complacent waking dream. Mm -hmm. um, Realising yourself, whether you want to call that magic or whatever you want to call it, realising mm. yourself as a person, as an individual, as an identity, um, that is like waking up. Yeah. And you realise that... Yeah, actually, this very solid world around us, that's a dream too, uh, yeah. as we were just saying. Yeah. That all started out in somebody's mind. Yeah, completely. This is all uh, a more viscous dream. It's sort of, uh, if in, in a lucid dream, you decide that there's going, when I turn that corner, there's going to be a brilliant mansion there, and it's all going to be mine. Mm -hmm. Now, in a lucid dream, yeah, that can happen. You can do that. Uh, you'll turn the corner and there'll be your beautiful mansion. Yeah. That can be done in the physical world as well. It just takes a lot longer. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the two worlds are very, very similar. Yeah. And when you wake up in them, then you can have a certain agency. You can actually affect and, you know, you can impose your own will your own self upon the dream stuff around you, yeah. uh, which is surely what every human being should have the chance to do. Yeah. If, 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 if undistracted more would hopefully have that as their wish and wish, you know, and, and what this, they this do. is the aim surely of all responsible art. This and is the aim of all responsible magic. Mm -hmm. It's all about illumination, isn't it? It's yeah. all about putting the lights on and seeing where we are, um, trying to dispel some of this miasma of nonsense and irrelevance 
that we're surrounded by and actually see what our situation is. Yeah. Um, putting the lights on. Yeah. Magic, art, all of those things. Oh. That's what they're for. Well, that's, that's perfect. And that's, that's, that seems like a great point to end it on as hopefully people will have just had 90 minutes of gradually turning the lights on or ignoring the the distractions uh, the material of the, garbage of the material. trucks outside the yeah, window. exactly yeah. that well <laughs> thank you very much for for chatting um, is there anything like where should people keep an eye if they want to keep up to date on you i know you have a facebook page that's it's, it's yeah, well, run i've never by your seen daughter. it um, yeah. um but uh well you know i don't like to put myself about a bit not not too much, really. It's fine. So, people can find out. I think, people can uh, find it's out. It's always annoyed me when people at the end of interviews will say, here's my Facebook, here's my Twitter, here's this. If people want to know what Alan Moore is doing, the internet exists and they will be able yeah, to find they'll it they'll be able to find it. You know, I, I don't want to push myself down people's throats. Right, that's perfect. Well, th yeah, no. Thank you very much. And, uh, uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure to... chatting. Be Cheers. Great, mate. You've been listening to Scroobish Pits, the Scratch Jumpies. That was number three. We've got three down. We're, we're, we're in it now. And we're on iTunes as well. I know if you there was a bit of a delay being on iTunes, hopefully you've all got it and you can check the previous ones out and download. But yeah, it was amazing to sit and talk to Alan. And I definitely felt, I think you'll agree, there's there's space for further chat there. So um, yeah, that was good fun. Well, I'm going to go now, but next week we've got DJ Yoda, who is just a legendary scratch and hip hop DJ. He's done so much. He really was at the forefront of um, the kind of, the visual mixing as well as as just scratching in jesse bought more he was one of the first ones to bring more f fun to hip-hop and you know he's worked with and knocked about with B bismarck key mop just anyone you can list he's he's been in touch with so it was great to sit down and talk to him so check that out next week please subscribe if you'd like to su suggest anyone that you'd like to hear on the distraction pieces podcast or just hit me up i'm at scrooby 